Scientists used 192 gigantic lasers to supercharge a pellet of hydrogen the size of a BB inside the enormous Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California. That created a nuclear fusion burst of 10 quadrillion watts of power. Nuclear fusion is the same reaction that occurs in the sun and has long been a goal of scientists around the globe. This is a giant step toward the holy grail of energy research, to hit break even, to extract more energy than you put in. And this could eventually become a game changer. You see, fusion reactor is carbon neutral. It does not create carbon dioxide. It does not create copious quantities of nuclear waste that you find in fission plants with uranium. It does not melt down. You cannot melt down a fusion reactor. And the fuel, the fuel is seawater. Hydrogen from seawater could be the basic fuel. So this is too good to be true. And yet we've taken a giant step forward. This could be the energy source of the future. Cheap, too cheap to meter, using seawater, for God's sake, as its fuel. Can't melt down, uh, creates almost no nuclear waste. What's wrong? Why don't we have these now? Well, it turns out that when you heat hydrogen to tens of millions of degrees Fahrenheit, the temperature of the sun, things become unstable. And that's why this reaction took place over a hundred trillionth of a second. Just a snap of the finger. So in other words, we want to have a continuous stream of energy, not bursts of energy like what we found here. Now, the French wow. are also in a race. They have the ITER fusion reactor in Kardash, France. They're building their version of the fusion reactor. So we have a healthy competition now. Two gigantic fusion reactors one in the United States, three football fields in length, and another in the, in the southern France, costing about $10 billion. Where do you think, um, what industries will be on you know, the list of the top revenue companies, the top value companies in, let's say, 2040? When you take a look at the industries of the past, they were mainly based on oil and coal and fossil fuels. However, the fuel for the future is going to be data. Data will be the fuel for the future. And the companies that dominate the future will be those companies that I call leaders of perfect capitalism. Now, let me explain. Capitalism is a system whereby prices are set by supply and demand and there's private ownership. That's it. That's called capitalism. But capitalism is, is imperfect. You don't know who's cheating you. You don't know what prices really are. You don't know who's deceiving you in the marketplace. Prices fluctuate. And that's where computers come into the picture. Computers can give us a more accurate assessment of what prices really are in real time. So we can see the bottlenecks. We can see the choke points. We can see the friction of capitalism. For example, why is Amazon one of the biggest companies on the planet Earth? Because they digitize the middlemen. They digitize a source of friction in capitalism. And so that's one way in which value is generated by, increase, by decreasing the friction, by decreasing the choke points, the bottlenecks, the dead end, the speed bumps in supply and demand. And those companies are the future. Those companies of the future, which will dominate things, are the companies that can streamline the middlemen, streamline the waste, the inefficiencies, the redundancy of the marketplace, and they're the ones who are gonna survive into the future. What is the internet? The internet is the first type one technology to fall into this century. It is a planetary technology, the internet. What about the language of type one? Well, on the internet already, English and Mandarin Chinese are the two most popular languages on the internet. What about culture? We're seeing the beginning of planetary sports with the Olympics and with soccer. We see the beginning of a planetary music, youth culture, youth music, rap music, rock and roll. We're seeing the beginning of a type one culture and fashion, Gucci, Chanel. So we're beginning to see the beginning of a type one civilization right in front of us. But that's the danger. The most dangerous transition is between type zero to type one. Why? 
Because if we're type zero, we have all the savagery, all the brutality of our past. We came from the swamp just 300 years ago. 300 years ago, there was only magic, superstition, inquisitions, torture. That's the way it was just 300 years ago. And now we're headed toward type one. Every time I open the newspaper, I see the beginning of the birth of a type one civilization, a planetary civilization. Look at the pandemic. It's a planetary pandemic, but how do we deal with it? Globally, globally we did it and we're conquering it now. That was impossible just a hundred years ago during the 1918 Spanish flu outbreak. Now we can actually control outbreaks like this. So we're seeing the birth of a type one civilization, but it's dangerous because we now have nuclear weapons. We have the ability to create designer germs. We have the ability to alter the weather with global warming. Yep. So it's not clear whether we're going to make the transition from type zero to type one, but this is the greatest transition in human history. We are privileged to be alive to see this transition from type zero to type one. Before we become type one, we have all the savagery of type zero. We came from the swamp. Think about it. Think of what life was like just a few hundred years ago. A life expectancy, for example, something as simple as that, was 30 years of age for most of human history. We lived in a savage, barbaric past, uh, just struggling to stay alive. And of course, having enemies was a very convenient way to keep the masses ha ha happy and contented. A look at the Roman Empire. Many attempts were made to try to create a civilization, but they all failed. Why did they fail? Because there was not enough wealth to go around. Poverty, sickness, disease. But now we have the Industrial Revolution, the Electric Revolution, the Computer Revolution, giving us enough wealth that we don't have to constantly fight for it. And the question is, can we negotiate this transition to type one? If we can, we're talking yeah. about an age of Aquarius. By the time we're type two, by the way, we are immortal. No, nothing known to science can destroy a type two civilization. Meteors can be deflected, asteroids can be blown up, weather can be modified, no more global warming problems. Even the sun, even if the sun explodes, they can leave the sun and colonize another star system. So by the time you're type two, you are immortal. The danger is, the most dangerous period is between type zero to type one, because we still have all the savagery of the past. Digital immortality is something that is actually achievable within a few decades. Silicon Valley is already offering to digitize everything known about you to give a image, an artificial intelligent image of who you are. One day it'll be so perfect that it'll be almost indistinguishable from the real person. I would, for example, love to talk to Einstein. One day, pretty soon, somebody will digitize everything known about the person, his thoughts, his theories, his videotapes, and put a holographic image and make it available commercially. And I think one day we will become immortal. We will live forever. So I think one possibility is digital immortality when we have a library of souls, a whole library of people that have passed away but have left a digital legacy for us to marvel at.